newspaper men meet such interesting people. They know the lowdown, now it can be told. I'll tell you quite reliably off the record about some charming people I have known. For I meet politicians and grafters by the score. Killers, plain and fancy, it's really quite a bore. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. They wallow in corruption, crime and gore. Tingling ling, city desk, full the press, full the press. Extra, extra, read all about it. It's a mess meets the test. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. It's wonderful to represent the press. The Media Project is an opportunity to hear a lot about what's going on in the news media. I'm Rex Smith from the Upstate American, formerly editor of the Times Union, here with my veteran journalist colleagues. Right here is uh, Judy Patrick, former editor of the Daily Gazette in Schenectady. You insist on saying veteran every yeah, week. That's a great word. How you, <laughs> I thank you for your service. <laughs> Barbara Lombardo is here, formerly executive editor of the Saratogian and the Record in Troy. Uh, well seasoned. That's what we are. Tasty, indeed. And there's Ira <laughs> Fussfeld, <laughs> formerly an editor, then publisher of the Freeman in Kingston. The Lots of stuff. I'm the oldest person in the room. I'll, I'll accept being a veteran. I'm very grateful that you're yes. the oldest person in the room because it <laughs> precludes that role going to me. It's a lovely thing anyway. You know, we've seen a lot, of course. That's part of the reason that we are here, and we've seen a lot of stories come and go, but I am amazed at the pace of huge stories and how quickly they come. You know, we're following the war in Ukraine, and suddenly the conflict in Israel becomes bigger. We're following that, and then there's the political dysfunction in Washington, the actual shutdown of the House representatives for three weeks while the Republicans conduct their civil war. You're following that, and suddenly there's this massive storm rising, the fastest ever spin-up of a hurricane in the eastern Pacific, which hits Acapulco, and that's going on, and suddenly there's a mass shooting in Maine, and news organizations have to shift from the war abroad to the war at home. It makes you wonder how news consumers can keep track, or if they even do. Right? Uh, not only news consumers, but the news generators as well. I mean, it, we're talking about a time of great peril for many in the media financially, and all of these stories are coming. And although I don't know how much it's impacted the big networks where most of us get our news on a daily basis, but they're coming up with correspondence and they're getting them out into the field and they've got to spend the money to house them and feed them. And it's just, I hate to sound like the publisher who watches the bottom line, but that's what publishers do. I don't know how that comes about. And yet they also seem to be doing a pretty good job. They're meeting their obligations. Well, we don't know what they're missing. We don't know what they're missing. Right. right. Being in the field is essential, I think. And to be in the field, you need people. These stories are not something you can report on from a desk in New York City or Washington or Chicago. And I think when you get breaking news, it shows when you're just relying on social media or you're just relying on second or third hand reports. For example, in the case of the massive shooting in Maine, what I did when this first started to break, I went to the local newspaper, the Sun Journal in Lewiston, Maine, and they were all over it. They had six or seven reporters, which probably is their whole staff, telling us what they knew and what they didn't know and doing it in a careful way. But they covered all the angles. They had people on the scene. They were talking to people who were involved in the shootings, who were victims of the shootings. I mean, it was a classic case of this is why you need local news and you need a lot of people to cover the news because news is all over the world but I think to the point of whether or not people can keep on track of it sure if you can follow Major League Baseball in 10 teams all season long you can cover 10, 10 games. And I'm going to bet that, that what you saw was their digital version not their print version. There's no way they could have had all of that in print. The shooting took place at 8.30 in the evening and so there was no way they could have organized and gotten all of that in the next day's print. Print paper. is passe. Who print cares about passe. print anymore? Right. right? Barbara shouldn't we should we not even worry about it? I uh, wasn't going to say that to Ira. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, still, I still have ink uh, on my fingers. <laughs> I, I, I still get the Times Union and print at home. But when we talk about news happening, I don't think it makes sense to even be thinking about print in any way, shape, or form, except for if you're working for an entity that is still putting out a print product, yes, you want to figure out what are we going to put on the front page, how are we going to present it in a way that's still going to make sense yeah. tomorrow when everything has changed. So we're really thinking, as you're alluding to for Judy's question, it definitely is going to be digital, which is one of the fantastic things about digital is that we can be up to the second with the news 
And the not so fantastic thing is that we could be mistaken. We could be trying to fill space. You could be wrong immediately, <laughs> but you can with correct terrible it. Con- well, her, how you correct things sometimes oh, boy. depends on what Here it is. Here we get into all these questions, don't we? These are questions that are really relevant to this show. First, though, to the question of how you get people on the ground. So it's important in something such as a mass shooting, of course, but it's important and difficult in things like the war zone. Consider what's going on in Gaza. There are very few reporters in Gaza, and those who are are imperiled. Uh, The Al Jazeera correspondent lost his entire family in an Israeli bombing raid, and yet he is still reporting. So how do you know what's going on there when finding even reporters on the ground is very difficult? I think I just read that there's 17 journalists, as we speak, who have been killed in the war, which is more than already than Ukraine, which is over a year. 23, according to the count put out by Pointer. But the difficulty is when you have a mistake or when you have a question even about what's going on and the most significant of those that we really need to talk about is the reporting about the attack on the hospital with allegedly 500 dead this led to a headline in the new york times israeli air strike hits gaza hospital killing 500 palestinian health ministry says that was a new york times banner headline and their website. On the website. No, it wasn't an attack on the hospital, as we're now learning. In addition to the And it wasn't an Israeli yours. attack. That was. And their... there weren't 500 dead. But Parts... otherwise, it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> One of the key issues there was the reporter or whoever wrote the story was relying on the Palestinian Health Ministry, which sounds like it perhaps could be a reliable, credible organization, but it's not. It's part of the Hamas organization. Um, and it was clear from follow-up reporting on this that the Times acted way too quickly and that the people... People on the ground in the Middle East said, we better back off on this a little bit. The editors or whoever was in charge of the web that day had listened more carefully to the reporters with feet on the ground there. That wouldn't have happened. And the headline was up for way too long. Yes. And you don't get off the hook by saying you attributed it to a source. Why is that? Because I was going to raise that. Why? You have to it's judge not, the credibility have, of the source. Oh, all right. Attribution, though, is necessary. It doesn't get you off the hook. Well, they said adequate. it. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. They said it but can we believe it? And I found that terribly upsetting that the New York Times did what I thought was a callous, well, we could all agree that this has had long-term terrible repercussions because you can try to correct it, but you can't really undo the damage that's done. Tom Jones, who's the senior media writer for Pointer, a journalism think tank and training institute, I guess I would call it, wrote a column about this and he relayed some of the discussion so it is kind of secondhand and but he was relaying the discussion that went on in the newsroom about how to report this whether to report it but the editors decided should they hedge their bets how should they do it and so it was discussed as it would be in newsrooms but then there was a conscious decision to go ahead by the way hard-hitting incorrect headline so what did you not like about the times correction let's be clear the times has to their credit been transparent about this. Most of the other news organizations that followed suit and blamed Israel for this have not been similarly right. transparent. I think the BBC and the New York Times were unique. In Absolutely. Yeah. We yes. know this because the Times actually had an editor's note from Joe Kahn, the executive editor, who talked about this. We know what was going on in the internal messaging platform that they were using. As you mentioned, we had a senior news editor as well as a reporter on the ground saying, I don't know, I think maybe this is too strong. So. Ira, to your question, if you attributed it, doesn't that get you off the hook somewhat? I think not, because the rule for journalism is your goal is to tell the truth. And if you're telling a lie but attributing it to someone, that doesn't mean that you're fulfilling your journalistic responsibility. But let's say this occurs and it's going to be reported. And before we know exactly how accurate it is, should it not have been reported before you knew how strong the story of was? Of course it should be reported, but in a way that is hedging the blame. I heard some careful reporting on this in which they talked about something happened at the hospital, some sort of an explosion, and and it appeared that some people were dead, but they didn't know how many people were dead and who was responsible. And then they talked about the different scenarios where it could have been an Israeli attack or it could have been a Hamas rocket that misfired. So what's your headline? How would you have written that, what you just described? I think what they knew for certain was that there was some sort of incident at the hospital and that some people had died, but there was a lot of uncertainty about it. You hold what back you... reporting all the time of what's uncertain. Remember, wasn't there an old copy editing rule, at least I was taught by <laughs> an ancient copy editing teacher, that you can't use the word may 
in a headline. You report what you know. Also, by the way, you that's can, a great tip. Isn't that's that a great? great tip? Yeah. Frequently ignored. It drives me crazy when I see the word "may" in a headline. Yeah, may may not too. Also, by the way, you can use an exclamation point once in your career. So <laughs> use it correctly, and that's also disregarded digitally, especially these days. But those are little tips from journalism, folks. You can send your checks right here to wamc.org. I, I would mention that people make mistakes. Editors make mistakes. Well-intentioned, intelligent, usually careful editors make mistakes. And I do agree with what you are talking about, how the New York Times did a good job apologizing for and trying to correct its error. Yeah, but they changed the headline first. They changed it to Israel and Palestinians blame each, each other, other for yeah. blasts at Gaza Hospital. That killed it's hundreds. Close, it's getting so, closer, getting, mm-hmm. but still not there. And the fact that it was wrong in the first place and got a life of its own And I think this will be disputed for a long time. But understand it is in no small part because the Times is usually such an authoritative source. They're careful about this. They pay attention, which is why Joe Kahn thought he should write, in effect, an apology of mea culpa. But still... Well, would you say that this is an example of factors contributing to the public's lack of trust and belief in the media? Without a doubt. My problem with the Times correction was not the content, but the placement. I didn't think it was prominent enough in the paper. I read the hard copy, and I know it had already been shared online. Where was it in print? It was on page A16. Oh! oh no. And it was on the It belonged on page one, it where the story on page, was. It was yeah. on the bottom of the page, and right next to it was the day's other corrections. Now, one of the things I pat myself on the back, but my newspaper, I believe, was a among the first to have the corrections anchored on page two every day and with the corrections listed in the table of contents. Yep. Because one of the frequent, we've well experienced it, one of the frequent complaints was the yeah, you the stories on page one and the corrections on page 60. Well, we tried to address that. I don't know that my paper still does that, but... And people love to read corrections, by the way. It's a very well-read part of the newspaper. Yeah, and the Times has a lot of corrections every day, and to their credit, they're correcting them. I just want to point out, there was a bill in the New York State Legislature (laughs) that would have required newspapers to publish... (laughs) Brilliant, brilliant legislation. Would have required newspapers to publish corrections on the same page as where the error was made. That Uh, seems unconstitutional. Well, you would think, (laughs) yes. A very bright member of the Assembly locally put that forward. And the problem is, of course, what if you... You made a mistake in the Thanksgiving Day paper, which is the biggest paper of the year. You publish a mistake on page 112, and you don't have a page 112 until next Thanksgiving. So what are you going to do? <laughs> anyway, you sorry. Know, I'm ashamed we to digress. say I don't even know of that bad headline about the hospital explosion. What made it to print? Probably very little. You're right. Uh, I hadn't yes, thought about it. It, it did. I did see the print version, and actually it was slightly smaller because instead of the attribution which said Hamas says, because Hamas is a shorter count than Palestinian sources, which is, you know, yeah, even worse, very, right? Yeah. The issue here, the big complaint, what put the Times under the gun was the headline. It wasn't the content and the stories. It was just the headline. And now I'm going back to my original question, which is it's not easy to write a headline yeah. with all of that in there, including who we're attributing the story to. Yeah. But you're not using that to excuse the content of the headline. You're just explaining uh, that headline I'm, writing I, is I'm challenging. I'm saying that the Times attempted to put attribution in the headline, and yet was still criticized mm-hmm. because the attribution was not solid. Yeah. On the internal line, the internal communication, one of the senior editors wrote back, you don't want to hedge it, question mark. And a reporter covering the war from Jerusalem wrote, better to hedge. And the senior news editor replied, we're attributing. So there was a real discussion about it, which is the way these things are right. handled in a good newsroom. It's not the way things are handled in a lot of places. You know, we know that at Fox News, there are intentional lies that are supported by top management and that they amp up the misstatements intentionally, folks, which is why you can't trust it. But to the question of, is this one of the reasons why trust is down in the media? I wonder if it's because of this kind of thing or whether it isn't because people are being told not to trust the media. This, to me, might encourage trust because at least you can see the journalists are trying to find the truth, even in errors. Mm. Uh, I think it undermined their credibility. I mean, I remember first seeing the the headline thinking, oh, wow. But then as the real news came forward, I said, am I going to be able to trust them? Or am I going to have to always look for alternative sources for every story I read and try to figure out the truth? Yeah, and boy, how many alternative sources are you going to find for 
international stories I alluded to in the very beginning of that there's not enough people covering them and there's the number of deaths out there is extraordinary. Those who Terrible. trust the mass media a great deal, according to Gallup, or a fair amount, is the lowest it's been since 2016, 32%. That's about what it was in 2021. 29% of U.S. adults say they have not very much trust in the media, none at all, 39%. So more people have no trust at all than even not very much. It's really very bad. And so maybe that's why people are turning away. Well, did they break that down by ideology? I mean, I, I would argue if you watch Fox News or listen to Steve Bannon or whoever is on that side of the aisle and you hear it every day, a large part of which is denouncing what's in the mainstream papers, you can't blame people for being misled. My word is misled, but for certainly distrust. If every day you turn on Fox News and, and Hannity is blaming the New York Times or something. And Fox News, of course, you haven't found out that Fox itself had to pay $870 million in damages for the lies it told about the results of the 2020 well, one election. Of the, uh, one of the most recent example of uh, one of the lawyers who pleaded guilty in the Trump case in Georgia, they said Fox News got all of three minutes reported during the day on that. Other news outlets were, were flooding the airways with it, not that, Fox News. That survey found that there was less trust among Republicans in general, but it crossed all demographic groups. The other thing about that survey that was a little disturbing was trust in social media as a source of information is still fairly small, but it's rising. It's notching up a point from 2016 to 2022. People are slowly increasing their trust in the information they get from social media platforms. Just watch out. Even as the trust factors are dropping, even as Elon Musk lays off the team at, uh, or laid off a year ago now, the team at Twitter that was trying to keep track of this stuff. And X, formerly Twitter, is cashing in on super spreaders of misinformation. X is actually making a lot of money off intentional misinformation. And this is part of Elon Musk's hey, formula. they're paying eight obviously. bucks a month for that verified check. Yeah, great thing. Why not? I don't think we should be on X. And if you're helping Elon Musk to make his money, I think that's a shame. You're you're a part of the disinformation machine. If oh, you're man, Rex, that. I'm so sorry. I mean, I'm really <laughs> three thinking. But when I was trying to find out information about the Lewiston shooting, the amount of misinformation was incredible. It certainly was. And the best way was to go to a, a homepage of a credible news organization, especially a local news. Well, media. I still look at X. Disinformation aside, it's not nearly as newsy as it used to be. You can see that a lot of news organizations are no longer posting to X. And in, in its heyday, Twitter was a, almost like an AP wire. Mm -hmm. Now you don't find it. And what they're doing recently, I think we've discussed it, is that if you wanted to link a story, they're not including the links on all of their stories anymore. They're eliminating them. And they get so, rid of headlines also. Yeah. So you, it's harder to even, it just flies over you. And on my, on the Upstate American, I use art for my piece every week and they get rid of that now. So but uh, it, it's stupid for them because if people can't link to your com or whatever they want to link to and can't do it, well, why the hell do you have to go to that site to begin with? So that may be one of the reasons why people are actually following the news less closely. I don't know. They find it harder to find because the social media are devaluing it. You don't see it as much on Facebook. Twitter is pushing it down. In 2016, according to a new study from Pew, slightly more than half of U.S. adults said they followed the news all or most of the time. Okay, half of U.S. adults following the news. In August of 2022, that number was down to 38%. So if you're losing a quarter of the people who are following the news in a single span of six years, the percentage rise of following the news only now and then rose from 12 to 19%. So we are finding that Americans are disassociating from the news or stepping away from it. Is it because the news is bad so much of the time? Or is it because they don't trust it? Or is it because they can't find it? But also your base year was 2016, which was the year of the Trump campaign, which I think we, we saw a tremendous bump. I would love to see the numbers before 2016 to see if it's truly been a, a strong point. decline. Mm -hmm. But I think that the loss of trust that we're talking about, you're right, has got to be a significant factor leading people to step away from the news. And yet, if you don't follow the news, you, you don't know <laughs> what you don't know. You, right. you, you're you left with just the uh, propaganda that finds its way into your hands in political campaigns. Uh, so what's the answer? What can we or people who will believe in 
free and accurate press do to turn the tide? I don't. I don't know the. I don't know the. I wish I did know the answer. I'd well, I think book. great journalism is one thing. You need journalists who really have technical skills, who know how to deliver news on TikTok, frankly, and who can write fetching interesting news stories that will get people. Uh, you need civics education. You need news literacy. It's a long road, though, to get back. And first, you probably need political organizing to try to get us to a place politically in this country where you have truth tellers in office and not maligners of integrity. You know, it could be people are not paying attention to news as much because it's so depressing and it's so discouraging and so scary. I think one of the things the media could do is do more solutions journalism and offer people some ray of hope that the climate is not going to burn out of existence, that, you know, your children are not going to be shot in, in the school if we do this and that. I think there's some modicum of hope in that realm. How hmm. strong it could be? Well, could be I would argue that you, when I was a boy, when I was a boy, <laughs> we were bombarded. You know, we'd hide under our desks to prevent us from getting killed in an atomic bomb. Polio before the vaccine came. And there were there were always negative stories. I'm just my contention is it's just, that it's just we're overwhelmed by it. We used to get the paper in the afternoon and we would read it before dinner. And that would be your news content for the day. Now you're people who are shut-ins and right there who, who are listening and watching all day long and they're becoming hypnotized by it. I think that's more than anything else the reason that people are worn out by news and distrustful of news. Hmm. Worn out because there's so much of it. There's so and, much of it, and a lot of people are sitting at home watching nothing else but. And our nerves are frayed yeah. by the constant drumbeat, by the nature of the way it's presented, especially when we have uh, so much violence like the main mass shooting. You know, there's a mass shooting that comes along practically every day, but most of them not as big as this. Although I would say that that's an example of a type of news story that will get people's attention, and people will want to know what's happening with that. Hmm. Same as a few weeks ago when the, the girl from Saratoga County was abducted. Things that are of human interest will catch people's attention and they'll want to know what's going on. And, if, and for the main one, at least until the point where the perpetrator is captured, I hope by the time people are listening to this, the perpetrator has been captured. So then people might start tuning out because it's the same old story again. You go through the whole litany the, of Nothing really reactions. happens. This is the problem with, you know, I, I agree that, that solutions journalism is a lovely notion, but the problem is there is no solution to mass homicide because our democracy is imperfect because the House of Representatives is ruled by a minority party that has extra power because of the constitutional flaws <laughs> that uh, set our system uh, to assure minority rights. And so we don't get the gun control that 80 percent of Americans want, frankly, in the same way that we are getting uh, abortion restrictions that 68 percent of Americans don't want, uh, according to polling. So if the democracy doesn't respond with mm -hmm. with solutions uh, it's hard for journalists to have kind of a positive outlook on things, and you do end up giving people bad news. I'm getting depressed by this Me too. Thanks a lot, Rex. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Judy's role with the New York Press Association is an example of a critical position for getting local news, and, and people will follow news if it means something to them. And I think that starts Boy, that's right. at the local level. And as the, on the federal level, if they don't think that it's relevant to them, if, it, if it's just the politicians that they can't do anything about, it's easier to tune it out. That is well, so there, true. And there are stories as a result of the shortages of staffs that are no longer being written that will explain what it means to the local people if there's, a, for example, a shutdown of the government. You'd always have that story first, and then you'd have the sidebar with the local ang the local angle. There's no sidebar anymore because there's nobody to write it. Yeah, but there are small uh, efforts being made, small uh, newsrooms throughout local communities. You're throwing uh, the starfish back in the ocean. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. Let's right, help yeah. this help the starfish population. But people are trying uh, either not for profit newsrooms or uh, for profit efforts on a local level uh, that are trying to bring local journalism back. Uh, because if you if you know that there's a reporter who graduated from the local high school and that person is trying to give you local news coverage, you tend to believe, well, there's journalism at work, uh, and maybe that begins to restore. 
It your might. Trust. And to help us end on a down note, I would tell you that one of my <laughs> best <laughs> students. We're already down. We? <laughs> we're already we're down. Go ahead. One of we're my best students in journalism at UAlbany from a semester or two ago has graduated and turned down a reporting job in the capital region because it paid so much less than her current job at a restaurant oh, no. that she could not afford to take the job and is trying to figure out what she's going to do next. Well, so we have a lot of problems within the industry to address. There are some not-for-profits that are trying to attack that, you know, by subsidizing local news organizations so that they can afford to hire staff. Report for America is a visible example, and there's an effort to raise, is it $500 million by a consortium of organizations to fund local news uh, so that that... Right, they're still trying to right. raise that money. Yeah. Just so, just so you know. <laughs> Hasn't reached the goal yet. Realist. That fund drive's still going on. <laughs> well, seventeen dollars an hour wasn't going to cut it. Get the WAMC people to help with the fund drive. There you go. <laughs> a couple million let's, in the hurry. let's hear it. All right, folks. We are at the end of our half hour. I'm sorry. So. I'll yes. be happier next time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's tough news out there, but we're very grateful to you for tuning us in to listen to it. Here with Ira Fussfeld and Barbara Lombardo and Judy Patrick, and I'm Rex Smith, with thanks to our producer, Dave Gussina, and to you folks for joining us on The Media Project. They all got tired of patches on their pants. They organized a union to get a living wage. They joined with other actors upon a living stage. Now newspaper men are such interesting people. When they know they've got a people's fight to wait. The Media Project is a national production of WAMC, Northeast Public Radio. This week's projectors include former Times Union editor and current Substack columnist of the Upstate American, Rex Smith, Judy Patrick, former editor of the Daily Gazette and vice president for editorial development for the New York Press Association, Barbara Lombardo, the former editor of the Saratogian and a journalism professor at the University at Albany, and Ira Fussfeld, publisher emeritus of the Daily Freeman. You can listen to The Media Project anytime at wamcpodcast.org or anywhere you get your podcast. I'm your producer, David Gustina. Thanks for listening. To working folks, for readers, and to big shots for their dough. Now publishers are such interesting people. It could be prostitution, I don't know. ting ling ling circulation, ting ling ling advertising. Get those readers, get that payoff. What a headache, what a mess. Oh, publishers are such interesting people. Let's give free cheers for freedom of the press.